In the year 859, 62 Viking ships sail south towards the Mediterranean. Jorn Ironside, Hastings, and their faithful Vikings raided down the coasts of France, Spain, Italy, and North Africa. Along the way, they attacked several cities and filled their ships with slaves and booty. The warriors from the north want to plunder Rome, the world's most powerful and richest city. But the city is well guarded, and the Vikings must devise a cunning plan to gain access to all the riches. Their plan was brilliant and inspired one of the most famous scenes in the TV series Vikings, which led to an astonishing victory. The Vikings had conquered Rome, the Eternal City. Or did they? Jorn's campaign started with a successful attack on Paris, and when the looting was finally over, Paris was a smoking ruin. Only four of the city's more than 25 churches were spared by the Vikings. After the attack on Paris, the Vikings settled on the island of Jufos in the river scene, west of Paris. The famous and infamous Viking chieftain Hastings had an idea. When we can plunder Paris, northern Europe's largest city, and humiliate the French king, who could stop us? The two Viking chieftains knew that further south there were cities that were bigger and richer than Paris. And as no city was bigger, richer, and more glorious than Rome, the Eternal City, they set course south with 62 ships. When the ships reached Spain, they were already well loaded with gold, silver, slaves, and other booty. Most of Spain was controlled by Muslim Moors from North Africa, and previous raids had taught the Vikings that these black-clad and veiled warriors were not to be trifled with. An attack a few years earlier had ended in a crushing defeat for the Vikings, and for once, they themselves had to pay a ransom to get away with their lives. But not even the fear of the warlike Moors could quench the gold thirst of Bjorn and Hastings. The Viking fleet tried to sail up the Guadalquivir River to plunder the rich Seville, but already at the mouth of the river they ended up in battle with the large Moorish fleet. The Vikings lost two ships with expensive cargo and quickly discovered that it was best to move on very fast. Stop, The Vikings sailed south through the Strait of Gibraltar and into the Mediterranean, possibly the first Vikings at these latitudes. Here they continued their raids along the southern coast of Spain and crossed the Mediterranean to North Africa, where they took on what the Vikings called Blue Men, Black Africans, as prisoners. Check my video, The Vikings in Africa, for more on that. The Vikings then rampaged the coasts of Spain and France and finally reached Italy, they were approaching their destination. Jorn and Hastings continued along the Italian coast until a beautiful sight met them, a city of shining white marble. They could make out temples, colonnades, and an amphitheater, and was surrounded by green, lush oases, vines, and olive trees, and sparkled in the sun. The Vikings cheered. Finally, they had arrived at their destination, Rome. But when the Vikings approached, they saw that the city was surrounded by huge walls and were guarded by heavily armed soldiers. Jorn and Hastings realized that an attack would not have a good outcome for them. Therefore, the blasphemous Hastings determined that well, as no power could conquer the city, it must be taken by the most abominable treachery, writes the French priest and chronicler Dudo of Saint Quentin, who lived around the year 1000. The next morning, a group of Vikings cautiously approached the mighty walls and called out to the sentries that they wanted to talk to the city council. After a while, the city's leading figures arrived, rather anxious about what these long-haired, fur-clad warriors had in mind. We have not come to rob you. We have no more strength left. We are exhausted from all our travels. We ask you to make peace with us. Let's buy what we need. Our chief is weak and broken and seeks salvation through baptism. And if he should meet his death here... He wishes to be buried in this city. They would save another heathen soul into God's grace. The delegation on the city wall was relieved. 
Not only did the strangers ask for peace, their chief would even accept the Lord's blessing. Gudu of St. Quentin, who wrote a couple of hundred years later about the Vikings' bold plan, knew how the story ended, writing bitterly, The water is taken from the source of the well and consecrated, the incense is lit before the holy ceremony of baptism, and the swindler hasting, the vicious mastermind of this betrayal, is carried in. Treacherously, he descends into the fountain which only cleanses his body. Unfaithfully, he has received baptism and condemned his own soul. After the baptism, Hasting was blessed and anointed with holy ointment and oil by the bishop. The dying warrior smiled bravely during the ceremony, and with worried expressions, his companions carried him back to the ships. Safely back in the Viking's camp, Hasting stood in front of his men and gave his orders. When night falls, you must tell the priest and the duke that I am dead, and pray fervently that I be buried in your city. Say that you will give them swords and bracelets and everything that belongs to me. That same evening, the city's guards again saw a delegation of Vikings approaching the city gate. This time, they also called out to the sentries, now with sadness in their voices. Our chief, whom you have just baptized, is dead. We, uh, the unfortunate ones, ask that he be buried in your monastery and that you accept the rich gifts he gave you on his deathbed. The council of the city fell into the trap, and Hastings' body was carried into the city with pomp and splendor. It was on a stretcher, surrounded by all his weapons. Beside him walked the chief's faithful men, beating their chests in despair. The bishop lets the bells ring so that people gather from all over the city. As if by one hand, they were led towards the monster lying on the stretcher, writes Dudo. The Vikings and Romans walked side by side and carried the newly converted chieftain's stretcher into the church where Hastings' body was placed in a coffin. Jorn and Hastings' men spread out around the church. Suddenly, the coffin lid slammed into the floor and Hastings jumped up. The bishop was still standing with the Bible in his hand when he was pierced by Hastings' sword. Meanwhile, the Vikings blocked all roads out of the church and seized their weapons. The defenseless Romans were locked inside the church, and it was as if the Vikings had been transformed into hungry wolves in a pen with lambs. The gates were opened, and the Vikings, who had not already entered the city walls with the mourning procession, now rushed in. Those citizens who tried to defend their city were caught between the two hordes of warriors and didn't stand a chance. All resistance was now defeated, and the city was in the hands of the Vikings. In triumph, Hasting commanded the citizens to fall to their knees and salute him as the ruler of Rome. While the Vikings stood triumphantly around their chieftain, one of the townspeople dared to raise his voice. This is not Rome. But the city of Luna, Dudu writes, with a poorly hidden gloating. In their eagerness to conquer the world's most powerful city. The Vikings had landed too far north. They had missed Rome by 315 kilometers, or 196 miles. When someone giggled, <laughs> Hastings exploded red hot with rage. <laughs> Enraged, he yelled that Luna would be punished for this. He ordered the city to be plundered of everything of value and then set on fire. The city's inhabitants were to be taken away as slaves, and those for whom there was no room on the ships were to be slaughtered like dogs. After the looting of Luna, Bjorn, and Hasting sailed further south, east, perhaps, as far as Alexandria in Egypt. Finally, the two Viking chieftains, after ravaging the Mediterranean for a couple of years, decided to turn their ships home, but the trials were not over. The Moors had not forgotten the Viking raids along the coasts of Spain and North Africa. At the Strait of Gibraltar, the Muslim fleet was ready and waiting to attack the Vikings. The Vikings were exhausted after three years of continuous raiding, and their ships were heavily laden with booty. Thus, the voyage through the narrow Strait of Gibraltar became a pure massacre. When the Viking fleet finally came out into the Atlantic, only 20 of the ships had survived the Moors' attack. 
In 862, three years after they had left the island of Jufos, the Vikings finally saw the mouth of the French River Loire. When they traveled, Jorn and Hastings considered France an enemy country. But now, after three years of hardships and dangerous adventures under the scorching Mediterranean sun, it must have felt like returning home. The story of the Vikings' raid on Rome and their ravages in Luna sounds very far-fetched, but British archaeologist Brian Ward Perkins is convinced that it is true. He does not believe that Hastings confused Luna with the rich Rome. That detail was probably added to the story later to portray the Vikings as inept and unintelligent. The well-traveled Vikings who had seen Paris and Seville would never have mistaken Rome and Luna, he believes. The only source of the confusion comes from a French priest and chronicler Dudo of St. Quentin. The Vikings had repeatedly humiliated French kings and armies, and Dudo may have portrayed the Vikings as stupid and treacherous in an attempt to save the last vestiges of French honor. After Luna's voyage, Hastings went wild on the French west coast and did so for thirty years. By his contemporaries, the cunning and brutal chief was called a revelation from hell. Remember to like and subscribe for more Viking videos. And please check out the other topics I cover here on my channel to see if there are others you also find interesting. And I hope to see you in the next one.